Respektable, sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, sehr geehrte Gäste, liebe Studenten, dir Rahul und Anjali, es ist heute mir eine Freude, Ihnen Rahul Mukherjee vorstellen zu können, da wir hier gesammelt sind, um Rahul willkommen zu heißen, werde ich mich erlauben, die Sprache zu wechseln und weiter in Englisch zu reden. Uh, Thomas has already taken away some of my most important lines, but I can go a little bit more quickly. Rahul graduated in economics honors from Delhi University, went on to the School of International Studies at JNU in New Delhi. Further proof of the fact that JNU is something like a uh, a branch office or a sister institute with the South Asia Institute, the traffic between JNU and the South Asia Institute is constant and a wonderful thing. Uh, graduated, got his PhD in political science at Columbia University with a thesis entitled A Path to Trade and Investment Liberalization, India. Specializes in comparative politics, international relations, governance, and of course, South Asia. He's worked a long time at Singapore, where he was involved both in the political science department, where he was head of research of the Institute for South Asian Studies. Before that, he was associate professor, JNU, fellow of the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation in New Delhi, a research professor at the Center for Policy Research, and he's had affiliations at Dartmouth, Georgetown, and the University of Vermont in Burlington. Did you get to know Bernie Sanders when you were there? <laughs> Lots of fellowships and awards, I won't list them all out. Only the more recent ones, he got the National University of Singapore Award for Research and Excellence twice, in 2012 and 2014. Been a fellow lots and lots of places, I won't list them all out, and nor will I uh, uh, burden you with the very long list of publications. One always says that, but it's really true this time. I'll just mention the more recent books, which are also on the poster. Globalization and Deregulation, Ideas, Interests, and Institutional Change in India, 2014, Oxford, Political Economy of Reforms in India, 2014, Oxford, same year, and recently co-authored with Sumit Ganguly, India Since 1980, uh, translated, by the way, into uh, Portuguese, into Brazilian. And that's only the beginning, lots and lots of articles, uh, Journal of Asian Studies, Journal of Development Studies, Economic and Political Weekly, Pacific Affairs, and so on and so on. Very long list of book chapters, research grants, including the most recent research grant, which we at the South Asia Institute can profit from, thankfully, uh, uh, from the Murdi Curie Foundation for 500,000. Lots of lectures, Italy, Switzerland, China, Poland, India, and a number of other places. My own sense of Rahul is uh, someone who seems to know everyone of importance in the political and economic circles in India. No matter whom you mention, he knows them. Uh, and he's friends with them. At least that's what he says. <laughs> but he also keeps a judicious uh, distance with regard to his own political views. He's deeply interested in the other social sciences. Uh, he's very historically informed and he practices what he calls political ethnography, of course, as an anthropologist, I like that a lot, which means that rather than uh, doing mass surveys, he actually goes and talks to people in real life situations, interacts with them, and generates part of his data and his theory from these up close, real life interactions, something I very much appreciate. Um, we at the South Asia Institute are delighted to have him as part of our team. And now, Rahul, the floor is yours. Sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, mein besonderer Dank gilt Professor Klein und Professor Sachs, die mir geholfen haben, diese Vorlesung zu organisieren. Da, da ich noch nicht so gut Deutsch spreche, ich werde jedoch meinen Vortrag nun auf Englisch halten. So I'm already challenged before I begin this lecture, and I carry a huge guilt uh, to be speaking in a language that uh, ought not to have been used in this August assembly. But I beg your pardon, and I will proceed. 
This is uh, indeed an awe-inspiring occasion for me to be delivering my Antrit for Lesung in Germany's oldest citadel of knowledge, from where scholarly vibrations have reverberated throughout the globe. I am amidst colleagues, students, and friends who inspire me to think that Heidelberg along the Neckar is just the right place to contemplate the thoughts I'm going to share with you. The year 2017, the 70th year of India's independence, is an especially opportune moment for reflecting on how India is governed. The substantive part of India's democracy is ridden with many challenges. Does India's liberal democracy, amidst unprecedented diversity, have the capacity to serve the citizen? India is such a functioning anarchy that even the Indophile economist and Harvard professor John Kenneth Galbraith once opined that you have to rest your faith in God if you want to think systematically about how India is governed. How does a poverty-stricken democracy at birth in 1947 the most, with the most diverse populace govern? Each state in India looks like a country. So the province of West Bengal is more different from Indian Punjab than adjoining Bangladesh. Northern and Southern India resemble different countries. Kerala, for example, resembles Ukraine, whereas Uttar Pradesh and Bihar resemble Sub-Saharan Africa. Influential scholars in the West had opined that India was a British imperial construction that would soon disintegrate. How then is citizenship produced in a country that embraces and often takes pride in diversity? Citizenship and governance are deeply intertwined. Governance can engender order and economic growth. It can engender rights such as the freedom of expression and basic human needs. Populous, large and economically dynamic India is beginning to play an important role in shaping global governance as well. India is the world's third largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. Its growth rate is among the highest in the BRICS. Last year, the country's growth rate even surpassed China's. This is significant. Even though China's historic rapid growth, the most rapid growth known to man mankind, has produced a substantially large, e larger economic pie. What is more interesting is that India's growth is driven to a much greater extent by the internal rather than the global economy. India's growth forces us to think that rapid economic growth is possible in a post-colonial and diverse liberal democracy, very different from the standard narratives of the rapid growth that has taken place in Eastern Asia. India also presents a paradox. How can a democracy with slightly less than a quarter of its citizens living below the $1.25 poverty line at purchasing power parity be called a democracy? India's schools are in very bad shape, although there are numerous schools in India. They certainly don't look like Germany's schools or China's schools. One therefore has to reconcile India's rapid economic growth amid poverty with rising inequalities and a dismal rate of job creation. There is a powerful view that India is merely a successful procedural democracy. Few would disagree that elections in India are largely free and fair, Many had opined that the right-wing Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, would win elections in 2004. Surprisingly then, the BJP not only lost in 2004, it remained out of power for 10 long years. When leadership crises and corruption scandals afflicted the Congress Party in 2014, citizens voted the BJP back to power. That year, a clear majority of seats was won by the BJP for the first time. 66% of the 814 million Indian voters cast their vote. No country in the world has had to deal with 800 million voters in one electoral extravaganza amidst such diversity. So let us now consider this paradox. You have a democracy and you have rampant poverty, poverty you have economic growth, so some scholars have suggested that India is a democracy which is ridden with clientelism. The democratic failure to serve the Indian citizen has been de described by the term clientelism. 
Clientelism is based on patron-client relations where electoral outcomes can result from ethnic or class-based populism that does not serve the vast majority of the populace. Oftentimes, citizens vote on the basis of age-old, ascriptive Indian institution caste. Kanchan Chandra, for example, has argued that the poor and the most oppressed Dalit voters voted the Dalit Chamar caste-based Bahujan Samaj Party in the large province of Uttar Pradesh, not because the party would uplift the socially and economically marginalized groups. They voted just because they felt more secure with their own caste ethnic group in prominent positions of leadership. Ethnic voting for Chandra becomes rational because the marginalized Dalit population feels comfortable in the absence of any information regarding other candidates, as well as in the presence of a predatory social system. The Congress earlier had given representation to the Dalits, but the BSP was a Dalit party that gave representation to upper caste groups. The tables had clearly turned. There is a long literature on this, and it will take more than 40 minutes even to summarize. But moving on from this idea of clientelism, I also want to talk about another approach to clientelism. Economists and political economists like Pranab Bardhan and Ashutosh Varshne have contended that interest-based coalitions in India are very powerful, like farmers, industrialists, and professionals. And they make governments take decisions that are fiscally unsustainable, and neither good for economic growth nor human well-being, such as free electricity to all farmers, subsidies for unproductive industrialists and professionals, and so on. This is one of the reasons why, unlike East Asia, India has not been able to grow, nor has it been able to provide the kind of infrastructure that you've seen in Eastern Asia, largely because these interest groups come in the way of disciplining capital. Such is the power of class-based and caste-based conceptions of policies and electoral outcomes in India that scholars were really puzzled when the Big Bang economic reforms of India happened in 1991. Why did India embrace globalization and greater private sector orientation when political scientists and economists largely had theorized India as a caged tiger? One scholar argued that these changes were largely due to pressures from the business class. Another argued that these changes could only be initiated by stealth. Policymakers pretended as if old policies were being continued when they were really changing the policy paradigm on the ground. Others just described the changes as the result of an elite revolt without properly conceptualizing the nature of that elite. More recently, anthropologist Partha Chatterjee made a significant contribution to this debate. He opined that India lives in a political rather than in a constitutional society. Politicians and bureaucrats allow citizens to lead a better life by not making constitutional provisions to safeguard them. Rather, they look in the other direction when citizens grab basic amenities such as housing and spaces for selling, often by illegal means. Poor people vote more often than the rich, so it is important to make these illegal exceptions to garner the vote for the politician. Even this logic of governance is clientelistic. The state acts to help the ruling party remain in power rather than benefit the citizenry at large. Clientelism is a kind of populism based on caste, class, and na other narrow interest group pressures. Clientelism-based explanations reveal why India lacks the capacity to grow and serve the poor. Scholars therefore need to look at other explanations to explain why rapid economic growth and some poverty alleviation has taken off in India. Clientelistic politics tells us why the glass of India's development is half empty. If we wish, wish to explore why it is half full as well, we need to pursue another path. Now let, let me talk very briefly about the governance literature from which I'm going to depart. There are scholars such as Atul Kohli, Pradeep Chibbar, Irfan Nuruddin, and Tariq Thatchel who have talked about the importance of the party in power. So for example, Atul Kohli says that the Communist Party of India, Marxist, won elections and was able to do land reforms because its social base was very different and because it had a coherent ideology. So the social base and the ideology of the party, when they come together, it seems that parties can sometimes make it work. There are others who, drawing on the literature 
willingly or unwillingly of social capital, argue that local intermediaries are very important. You have these local leaders who can bring projects to the rural, le rural level. So for example, my predecessor, Shubrato Mitro, argued that it was these elites, and he called them Gaonkanetas, that made modernization theory's worst, worst predictions not come true in India. In a country with increasing and diverse social demands that needed to be met in the context of limited institutionalization, local leaders played a very important role in assuaging demands. Most recently, and I am skipping a lot of the literature, the idea of challenger subnational elites driven by ethnic identity has been used to argue why some states succeed more than other states in India. According to this argument, states that have greater ethnic consciousness, driven by a common language, provincially driven political party, and subnational movements are more likely to prov provide welfare services to the poor. The feeling of weeness increases, and when this increases, there is a shared subnational understanding. This weeness and the subnational level creates a challenger elite that confronts the old elite and makes services to the provincial cause a serious issue. So this scholar argues that states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, for example, have done much better than many other Indian states because there is this feeling of weeness. Now what we are saying here is that, of course, a lot of this literature on clientelism is very important and it's, it finds a very respectable place where it should. But the status quo of a closed economy favoring the dominant coalition has been transcended in India. The country has globalized substantially. The country, a country that had all but banished foreign investment in 1991, now garners more investment than China in a typical year. India has given greater freedoms to entrepreneurs and state-level governments than ever before. Competition has driven down prices. How could a liberal democracy like India deal with powerful social actors to surge ahead? I find that many of these arguments based on party systems, subnationalism, and local intermediaries seem not to explain this transition. Human development has also taken off in India. Andhra Pradesh's capacity to implement the most successful right to work program in India happened in 2005 with the Congress party in power. There's a powerful constituency of economists which includes my dear colleague Stefan Klona, who maintain that the rights-based approach to, to development embodied in programs like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme did make an impact on Indian poverty. Andhra Pradesh's spectacular success is puzzling for the conjectures just discussed. First, the landed classes in Andhra Pradesh were very, very powerful. That's one of the reasons why the communists never came to power in that state. The Congress party was in power in Andhra Pradesh in 2005, and at the very same time, the communist party of India, Marxist in West Bengal, failed to implement that program. Moreover, moreover in other Congress rule states, we find that the program was not implemented properly. Andhra Pradesh also did not have a strong subnational identity. In fact, the story is that Andhra Pradesh got divided into Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in 2014. So the subnational identity argument does not work for Andhra Pradesh. And last but not the least, when you really implement a welfare program like the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is premised on the right to work in India, you are actually saying that for at least a brief moment, the political society argument has been transcended. Because the government is really saying that every worker in a rural area has the right to work. So you find paradoxically that there is a center left, not a radical left party in power, that produces this success in this program. So how do we go about trying to understand these anomalies? My research and that of some of my colleagues places quite a bit of emphasis on how the state thinks. This is a neglected area of theorizing in Indian and comparative politics and development. We find that bureaucrats and technocrats are incessantly puzzling and powering about policy. A lot of this puzzling happens within an organization that Max Weber famously described as the bureaucracy made up of permanent professional experts with assured salaries and job guarantees. 
Job permanence and expertise are the two characteristics that endow the bureaucracy with the ability to puzzle and think about how policies should be experimented and how they should evolve. The relationship between the technocrat or bureaucrat and the politician, in my view, is very important for understanding how the state thinks and how it evolves the capacity to act. So first and foremost, I want to put on the table that f the fact that bureaucracies learn from experiments and ideas the world over. How, are these ideas, how these ideas are implemented, however, depends on how this learning is internalized. When the US implemented Keynesian policies during the Great Depression, this policy paradigm was undoubtedly imported from Britain. Keynes had developed a powerful framework for governing the macroeconomic management uh, in Cambridge, England. Despite this import, the US substantially prior to Britain became the first country to give shape to these policies as a governance framework that stressed that markets fail and that employment may have to be artificially created by the state. Likewise, the rise of neoliberal market orientation in the West had a lot to do with the literature and economics that argued persuasively that overregulation had the effect of what economists famously call rent-seeking industrialization. Regulation, rather than directing investments in areas of need, favoring certain developmental agendas, were being used to favor certain constituencies in return for rents or bribes. The parallel literature on rent seeking in the industrialized and less developed world began to suggest that regulation should be reduced and markets should play a greater role in furthering economic growth and human well-being. These economic ideas subsequently had a powerful impact on the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and developing countries. Can we infer, therefore, that ideas merely diffuse and policies happen? I think not. How technocrats think and win political support for ideas that evolve is important for, in, for understanding how India moves. Let me belabor this point with a few examples. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, had earned the epithet of being learned. He was called Pandit. The work of technocrats such as Mahalanobis and I.G. Patel. Nehru was impressed both by Soviet planning and by Mao's experiments. In fact, the Indian second five-year plan was influenced by a Soviet experiment of 1928. The second five-year plan was also the work of technocrats such as Mahalanobis and I.G. Patel. Nehru needed technocrats to understand the nature of the Indian problem and ways to escape the decline that India had suffered during colonial rule. The father of Indian planning, P.C. Mahanovis, not only founded Indian planning, he also founded the world-renowned Indian Statistical Institute, where economists from across the ideological spectrum, ranging from Maurice Dobb and Oscar Lange to Milton Friedman, were invited to reflect on India's problems. The Planning Commission of India was thus founded within the Indian Statistical Institute, which till, the, which till today has a very high reputation for scholarship. Soviet or Chinese-style planning was not what India became in terms of its mixed economy model. Neither did India promote entrepreneurship like the US, nor was it British in outlook. India opted for a liberal democracy with property rights, where private entrepreneurship was stringently regulated, but never abolished. I will take another example to demonstrate how the importance of the way the Indian state thinks is paramount. The country faced a severe balance of payments crisis owing to food shortages in 1966. India had become heavily dependent on subsidized United States Public Law 480 supervised food grains. The US was impressed with Indian planning in early years, especially between the years 1957 and 1963. Given its status as a non-aligned country, both the US and the Soviet Union were competing to help India industrialize. These funds were used by India largely to promote heavy capital-intensive industrialization to the detriment of Indian agriculture. It was opined at that time that capital-intensive industrialization was the way for India to really catch up with the West. Agriculture was relegated to the background. It was assumed that organizational changes like land reforms and cooperatives would actually make India self-sufficient. So when the monsoons failed, 
American PL-480 wheat came to India's rescue. This was the reason why India did not get a famine like China did in the 1960s. All of this changed when President Lyndon Johnson came to power in 1963 after the assassination of President Kennedy. The US government and the World Bank turned skeptical about Indian planning. When India suffered severe food shortages in 1966, unavailability of imported, non-subsidized food grains would have halted India's planning. This was the very time when President Johnson and the World Bank President George Woods wished to coerce India to change its economic policies. The most famous condition for sending US food grains to India at that time was to devalue the Indian rupee. Currency devaluation, it was thought, would increase the price of imports and reduce the price of exports. This would enable India to get more exports with which it would be able to buy its imports. Technocrats at that time, like I.G. Patel and L.K. Jha, were consulted by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Large parts of the Indian technocracy and the political class felt that this was an imperial command of the U.S. that should not be respected. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi consulted her technocrats, momentarily devalued the Indian rupee, and allowed the shipments of wheat to come into India. But no sooner had these shipments arrived, the Indian policy response was to defy American goals at the very time when the Indian technocrats and the political class came together to say that this was an imperial command. So what did India do after the balance of payments crisis of 1967? India became even more close to the world and large-scale private entrepreneurship was regulated more stringently than ever before. The moral of the story is India is a stubborn country that thinks right or wrong but remains quite pig-headed about it. Now I want to introduce from this idea that ideas are important a kind of dynamic understanding of how they work in India. I have argued that India follows an evolutionary tipping point model of institutional and economic change. A tipping point has some salient characteristics. It resembles the earthquake model of change. Changes are evolutionary, gradual, and largely endogenous. Changes continue to evolve over a period of time till they reach a threshold. What appears to be a momentous change resembles an earthquake. Centuries of tectonic movements under the Earth's crust gradually leads to a situation where the plates hit hard against each other. People on the surface get devastated. What we observe as a symptom appears drastic, but it is the result of centuries of gradual movement. Meteorologists, even though they cannot exactly predict an earthquake, know where these pressure points exist. They know which parts of the Earth are unlikely to experience an earthquake and which parts are. How then can we locate a tipping point in social life? A tipping point must have the following characteristics. First, we should be able to observe small scale changes that accumulated over a period of time. These changes may not be clear to the casual ob observer, but they should be clear to anyone who has studied an institutional path carefully through a particular policy trajectory. There should be substantial difference between institutions and policies that evolved gradually and what occurred when the policy earthquake changed the course of history. This is substantially a story of gradual endogenous change. Let me explain in the remaining time, and I hope I'm not taking too much of it, why both the momentous economic reforms of 1991 and the success of the right to work program in Andhra Pradesh constituted a tipping point. In both cases, the state in India found the capacity to deal with powerful groups ranged against them and produce a new set of institutions. I have argued that the economic reforms of 1991 were not the result merely of a balance of payments crisis. After all, if financial crisis was to be the reason, reforms could have occurred in 1966 as well. I have described the considerable pressure that the United States and the World Bank put on India that paradoxically led India in a direction quite different from embracing the global economy. Two of the great students of India, the late Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolph of Chicago, have opined that Indo-US relations would have been very different had Lyndon Johnson not attempted to coerce India. Why then did the shift in policy paradigm embracing 
an Indian style of globalization and unleashing entrepreneurial energies occur in 1991. India, I have argued, reached a tipping point, having looked critically at old policies and having experimented new ones since the mid-1970s. <coughs> Significant reports of the government of India had criticized the closed economy model. The public sector was supposed to acquire the commanding heights, but it was inefficient and unsustainable. The over-regulated private sector had become a rent-seeking racket. I.G. Patel, the man who literally drafted the second five-year plan, lamented in his famous Kingsley Martin lecture at Cambridge University as the director of the London School of Economics that those guys who founded Indian planning had no idea that industrial regulation would become a rent-seeking racket between the politician, the bureaucrat and the entrepreneurs. In fact, Turkey and India were the two countries that singularly inspired the economics literature on the pathologies of import substituting industrialization famously calling it rent-seeking industrialization. Technocrats in their reports from the mid-1970s therefore argued that these controls had to go, trade had to be promoted, and the private sector and foreign investment had to be attracted. Gradual policy changes ensued in the 1980s. Freedoms were given to Indian entrepreneurs. The Indian rupee was gradually devalued. The pace of change, however, resemb resembled the tipping point model before the system tips. These changes were so gradual that political opposition to re reforms remained muted. Then came the balance of payments crisis of 1991. Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, one of the chief technocrats uh, who, who was an architect of the story, told, told me thus. He said that he visited Malaysia once in 1990 with, with Prime Minister V.P. Singh. And when Prime Minister Singh looked at the advance that Malaysia had made, he said, Mr. Aluwalia, what does India have to do to become like Malaysia? And at that point in time, a memo was written to the Prime Minister's office. And it is now well known that if you read that memo, you would know exactly what India did after the balance of payments crisis of 1991, when India negotiated a package with the IMF. The balance of payments crisis of 1991, therefore, was like a bicycle that crosses a bridge about to collapse. The external shock was no greater in magnitude than the two oil shocks that India had weathered. The only difference was that India was pursuing such fiscally unsustainable policies that commercial lenders were not willing to lend. It was at this point in time that the International Monetary Fund and India came together to produce what is now called a heterodox program. I'll talk about the heterodox program, but before I talk about the heterodox program, let me say a few things about Prime Minister Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh. Prime Minister Rao, in some senses like Nehru, was one of the most erudite politicians that India has ever had. But what's more interesting is that like Nehru, he understood that he needed to depend on technocrats to understand how India would be able to deal with a balance of payments crisis at the very time when the Cold War had ended. Finance Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh at that time was actually a very important instrument to understand this story uh, structurally. He had played not only a very prominent role in all the major institutions of economic policy making in India, including a governorship of the Reserve Bank of India, what was even more important is that he was a brilliant economist. In his doctoral dissertation in 1962, Dr. Singh is the first Indian economist who had argued that devaluation is good for India. And this was such a good and acute point to make that in an essay in honor of Dr. Singh, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has said that Manmohan was able to see things in the 1960s that I was not able to see. And not only did Dr. Singh make that point in his doctoral dissertation, which was published by Clarendon Press, he even argued why devaluation would actually produce the resources needed for India's exports. So we find ourselves in a situation where people who have thought about these policies and a policy team is present, and then India goes to the IMF for a heterodox program. The IMF generally dictates, and when it dictates, most countries fail. I mean, if you look at the literature on the IMF, it is supposed to be a bad doctor. 
But this was a different story. And the reason why this was a different story was because India was at a tipping point and India was therefore able to negotiate a fairly Indian heterodox program that made sure that labor laws were not amended, that made sure that there was hardly any privatization of the public sector, and the fiscal deficit was only reduced for one year, and that too not very substantially. So the Indian state was now able to deploy dependence on the IMF to globalize the economy and promote entrepreneurship. The rupee was drastically devalued in July 1991. And on the 24th of July 1991, uh, you know, India's economic history was changed. Uh, I could read how that history was changed, but uh, we, we should move closely. We should quickly move towards the reception, so I will uh, not belabor that point, which is in the text. The crisis was used effectively to deal with interest groups that would oppose reforms. The vast majority of Indian industrialists, for example, would op oppose the reforms process. Large and powerful industrialists did not want currency devaluation because it would in in increase their import bill. They did not want industrial licensing to be abolished because they had become past masters in obtaining these licenses from the government. So despite all of this opposition, what happened was that slowly and surely, a small industry organization that supported the government, whose name is now not well known at all, the Confederation of Engineering Industry, became the Confederation of Indian Industry in 1992. In 1991, when the reforms were taking place, they were just the Confederation of Engineering Industry. But the only good quality that they have and you know, these histories are quite complicated, was that they were somewhat more supportive of the reform package. So they became the most powerful industry organization in India. And no sooner had the balance of payments crisis ended, there was a very powerful group of industrialists called the Bombay Club of Industrialists who tried to block this program. But the political will was resolute and the institutions that, that had changed quickly and dramatically after a tipping point could now not be turned back. It took a while for the industrialists to realize that the very policies that they had opposed would make them very rich. Now let me quickly, in the last five to ten minutes, turn to Andhra Pradesh and to poverty alleviation. The implementation of the right to work in Andhra Pradesh has a similar causal narrative. Andhra Pradesh implemented this program more spectacularly than neighboring Tamil Nadu, which has uh, much greater literature supporting you know, why Tamil Nadu does better than Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and not only did Andhra Pradesh produce a lot of jobs for the unemployed, it was also found by econometricians and people who do quantitative work that they were able to target the poor much better than other states. So what is the story of Andhra Pradesh? I've already told you that there is no left party in power. It's a Congress party in power. The farmers are actually very powerful, and these are, there are construction companies that are very powerful. So how did the story unfold? Our research uh, is beginning to show, especially my research that I'm conducting with uh, Dr. Zarhani, is beginning to show that there is a way in which you have to understand how the Department of Rural Development evolved over a period of time in Andhra Pradesh. And this evolution was one where it supported politicians in the earlier phase to make donative gestures to citizens, like free rice or subsidized rice. And when such gestures were considered to be fiscally unsustainable, fiscally more conservative chief ministers came to power and they reduced these expenditures but replaced it with World Bank lending to support women entrep entrepreneurs in rural areas. This experience with donative policies and somewhat more entrepreneurial policies trying to uplift the poor, a little bit more like microcredit in Bangladesh, produced a situation where by the time Chief Minister Raj Shekhar Reddy came to power, the bureaucracy understood that you need policies that empower people. I mean, the market logic is not going to make all the difference that you want, and donative policies are not fiscally sustainable. So it was around this very time that we find that the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme had been launched. But why was Andhra Pradesh able to seize the opportunity? 
and do the best job among all the states in the country. The narrative that we are, uh, we are developing suggests that it was the Department of Rural Development, spearheaded by a man called Mr. K. Raju, actually worked very hard to convince the Chief Minister that it would be possible to have a right to work program if he gave the program political support. With that kind of political support, you would be able to deal with the very powerful farmers lobby as well as the construction companies which were averse to this right to work because you know, it would raise wages uh, in rural areas. Much of this work had to be planned, had to be deliberated within the technocracy and the Department for International Development of the, of the UK actually gave some money to, these, uh, to this small group of officers to do research in this area. And that research revealed something that neither the World Bank knew, nor the DFID knew, but it created a plan by which rural guarantees could be provided. That rural guarantees should be provided and that he would give the political support that was very, very important to deal with richer farmers as well as with construction companies. The implementation of this program had three major structural characteristics. The first structural characteristic was that village governments were completely ignored. Now this is almost like a scandal in India because India takes pride in, in having three million representatives at the village level. So the kind of philosophy that was implemented on the ground was that village is the den of caste hierarchy and that somehow you have to deal with the village and undermine the village with bureaucratic pressure. That's a complicated story. The second part of the strategy was that Tata Consultancy Services provided a transaction software that would enable civil servants to look at when the money is coming in and where it is coming out. And it was decided that the money would be given straight to the worker. So for the first time in India's independent history, money would not be given to a village headman or a headwoman to be distributed to the worker. And this is really what began the first attempt in India to open up large number of postal bank accounts and bank accounts that has now famously become one of the achievements of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has started this universal identity program which had its roots in this Andhra Pradesh experiment where a certain bureaucrat and a chief minister was thinking, how do I get the money straight to the person who is doing this work? And finally, and most importantly, state society synergies engendered the creation of the Society for Social Audit, Accountability, and Transparency, an acronym SSAT, SSAAT. We just call it SAT. I call SAT as bringing society back into the state. The Department of Rural Development created a regulator to monitor how money was being paid as wage. In the first stage, what they did was that they tried non-governmental organizations like MKSS and ActionAid to perform public hearings at the village level. When they found that public hearings at the village level by different non-governmental organizations could not be standardized, they realized that they had to actually create a regulator for credit within the state. And this regulator for credit became SAT. SAT would be funded with the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme's money coming in from the central government. On the head of SAT would be the Secretary of Rural Development of the, go the government of Andhra Pradesh. But its director was a person called, is a person called Soumya Kidambi, who is a consultant. She is an activist trained by MKSS in public hearings. She agreed to join government, but not as a government employee, but as a consultant. So she wants to keep, keep her progressive image uh, alive and sort of play down her conservative uh, role. On the head of Sat was the Principal Secretary of Rural Development, but on its governing board were three very famous social activists. This is the reason why I call the Society for Social Audit and Accountability bringing society back into the state. Clearly it is under the guidance of the state, but it works with a lot of non-state actors. Sat's credentials are impeccable. Some of the ethnographic work that I and my colleague Himanshu Jha have done has revealed that the social office audit office's data is just very, very good. 
they know where the problems are. They can even sometimes tell you about what the ethnography of those problems are. And therefore, what has happened is that this regulator has become very popular. It has been praised by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India and is now into many projects that are not just about rural employment guarantees. They are now a regulator for many programs of the Government of India. Now with that, I sort of end the substantive portion of my lecture and just reflect for two minutes what I may have been trying to say. I have described how the rich literature on clientelism has revealed a great deal about the pathologies of governance in India. Indeed, India's economic growth is matched with rising inequalities and low levels of human development. Despite these pathologies, India's growth and initiatives to uplift the poor seem to suggest that this is a sleeping giant just awakened. This chaotic rise, India's streets are filled with potholes and the cities are getting more polluted. You cannot remove the poor from the slums beside the Sahar International Airport adjoining Mumbai. So chaotic and diverse is India that you can easily go back with the impression that the state in an unusual nation has lost all of 70 years. A lot of literature will tell you why. We know much less about how India moves. Despite these problems, India is unique in the annals of history to have begun a post-colonial trajectory with such diversity as a poverty-stricken liberal democracy. It therefore takes much greater effort to create a consensus within such a large and diverse society. This happens slowly after a lot of political bureaucratic parring and puzzling. Often takes the shape, shape of a tipping point when a lot of puzzling and parring over policy reaches a threshold. It seems to me that while clientelism can tell us why the glass of India's governance is half empty, political bureaucratic interactions leading to a tipping point, on the other hand, can reveal how new institutional paths get consolidated despite substantial opposition. Puzzling and parring are very important for the state in the process of governance. India's liberal democracy is not the product of a democratic upsurge. Neither was India's globalization due to pressures from the business class, nor was India's rights-based approach, uh, approach to development powered by social movements. Technocrats and politicians, often after taking social actors and movements into consideration, puzzled and powered to take India along a path that no other country has trodden. Have we then neglected the power of ideas that have emanated from political bureaucratic interactions that scholars like Max Weber, Hugh Hecklow, and Peter Hall have pointed towards? This research program points to the fact that there is no one rationality in politics. It is important to discover how new rationalities are born and how they interact with politics to produce governance. Feeling dank for era of Mexamkite. Like